up everyone, this is Dariusz Kielbaczyk, co-founder of NG Poland, JS Poland, AngularMaster.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to the JavaScript Master Podcast. Today we've got a special guest from Wrocław, Poland. Senior developer, GDE, NAX team, Ambassador Storyblock, Algoria, Cloudinary, Superbase. Ladies and gentlemen, Jakub Andrzejewski. Hi Kuba, how are you? I'm uh, quite good. Uh, for those viewers or re- you know, listeners, uh, Kuba is the same name as Jacob, uh, but as me and Derek, as from the same country, we decided to speak with our uh, mother tongue, mother tongue names. So yeah, I'm quite good. Uh, today in Poland is really, really warm. Uh, yesterday it was really nice, but today is so warm that it's difficult to to survive in the in your normal normal shirt, normal clothes. So. Uh, yeah, but apart from that, uh, I'm really looking forward to this podcast and talking to you, Derek. Uh, as we met last time in, in Amsterdam for Google I.O. Connect, and then we met each other, and then this idea came up to talk, to meet and talk about stuff that we enjoy the most about web development. So for those who don't know you yet, please tell us about yourself. Sure. So my name is uh, Jakub or Kuba. Um, if you like to find find me somewhere on the internet, and uh, there will be a at Jacob Andrzejewski. This is easier for anyone apart from Poland to to recognize myself because my last name is quite difficult to to pronounce. Uh, however, I work at Vue Storefront as a senior full stack developer, and I would say this is like proper full stack because I am doing stuff from CSS to SQL to GCP, like cloud stuff. So basically everything where I am needed, I have to learn and adapt and basically do do this stuff. And apart from that, the same as Derek, I am also a Google developer expert uh, in web technologies. In my my case, it is about web performance, which is a, a sneak peek at topic of today's podcast as well. How did you start your adventure in programming? This is actually a funny story because uh, I always knew that I would be doing something related to IT, but IT in general, because this is what my father is doing. Um, he is like in IT, he's IT manager. So I always was looking at his job and uh, what he was doing on the daily basis. And I've seen that the things he is doing are really interesting, like the things with with computers, I would say it. Uh, but I never had this like self-motivation to start doing something on my own. So I just knew that I would be doing something in this area, but I wasn't sure what exactly. So my journey with programming actually started when I started studying during my first year, right after finishing um, high school, junior high school, st- starting the um, studies. I decided that, well, this is actually the time where I need to like point myself into a certain direction. So do I want to go for programming? Do I want to go for some kind of IT, security, support, management, stuff like that? Because I knew that it will be something with IT. And then I found out about a local scientific club in my university in Wrocław, uh, the the city where I live in, and there, I was able to not only learn programming, but I, because I started to like the topic really, really fast and really much, I decided that basically this is the time for me to shine and not only learn, but also teach. And almost instantly I started sharing what, what I learned and it didn't have to be something rocket science. Even a simple workshop about HTML or CSS or JavaScript, stuff like writing uh, for loops or, or doing if statements. For for me, it was a really nice uh, experience to not only learn about those concepts, but also about teaching. Um, yeah, so, so it started six years ago. And right after I started learning on my own and teaching, I also started working in a few companies, like company after another. And yeah, until this point where I am today at Vue Storefront, 
which basically summarizes my uh, career, I would say, quite well. Because this is the first place where I actually feel that I am doing the, the work that I like in terms of the area of expertise. And what I mean by that is basically this full stack thing. Because in other companies, usually I had this issue that um, this is, I think, called the issue of personality, like personality conflict. You are not entirely sure where you should uh, where you should be. Like, should should I be on the front end? Should I be on the back end? Should I be on the DevOps or cloud or IT, like support or anything else? And in, in view storefront, I have this opportunity to basically combine all of the worlds together and um, yeah, do what I like the most which is basically overall things related to, to web development. Could you explain the lazy pattern? How does it boost web performance? You may have heard about it or not. Um, I would su suggest or, or suspect that you might not have heard about the lazy pattern because this is something that I think that I have invented in this particular name. Maybe it was the, the, um, like described or created before, but with a different name. However, I created this kind of pattern specifically for grouping all the activities that you can do in your web application to make it work more efficiently, like for better performance. And they all are somehow connected to this like lazy, lazy keyword. So uh, I actually gave a talk about this lazy, mm, it was about optimizing images, but it was also con consists or it was in including the aspect or, or the pattern of um, lazy in Vue.js London in May. And basically this pattern and um, the, the idea of this pattern is to, it's very simple. It's basically to not load the stuff that is not needed for the user. And this is like the whole description whole definition. So it doesn't sound that complicated. However, the implementation details might be more or less difficult depending on the framework you are using or the technology you are using. So in this lazy pattern, what I decided to add uh, to this like wrapper pattern, I decided to add things, for example, like the lazy loading images. So how do, do, does the lazy loading image work. Imagine that you have, let's say, a gallery of images, something like Instagram or an application that basically has a lot of images. And you have a user that has 100 images, right? One after another, if you are scrolling on your mobile device. And then at normal situation, what would happen is that you would fetch those images all at the same time. So we will be fetching all those 100 images, even though they won't fit exactly in what the user can see, because user will probably see like two or three first images if we want to have them in the right um, resolution and, and quality. So what will happen is that you will be fetching those 97, let's say additional images that the user will probably not see at the first point, at first point, but they will delay the uh, initial load of your application. So basically your application will be slowed down for because of the resources that the user will not use at this point. So how this lazy loading works is that basically you can instruct the browser that for certain resources, you want them to be loaded once they will be in the viewport for the users. So basically when they will scroll the page and the resource should be there, the request for fetching this resource will start, but it will start at this point, not at the beginning of the like initial loading of the application. So this is one of the concepts that is inside of the, inside of the lazy pattern. And there's also things like um, code splitting, lazy loading modules, uh, lazy hydration for the server-side render application, and basically much more. Uh, so this is more like a wrapper in terms of the different different smaller patterns 
which um, are used to achieve similar result, which is basically to not load stuff that is not needed for the user at certain point of the application lifecycle. How does loading only the user required element affect web development speed? Because those resources, because th this doesn't have to be only the images, it can be much more. It can be styles, it can be third party scripts like, like you know, Google Maps or, or um, analytics or things like that. So because we are delaying the requests for those resources, it basically allows the, the our application to deliver uh, or the browser to deliver our application faster to the user. Because there are those resources that are not needed. They are either lazy loaded, they are maybe code splitted so that they are only available on certain pages. And because of that, the amount of uh, requests is decreasing, the amount of data that the user needs to fetch is decreasing as well which can be especially crucial for, for the users that uh, maybe don't have such a fast internet connection on the devices. Maybe they are using slower phones. Maybe they are, they, uh, they are on some kind of slow Wi-Fi in the cafe. And because of that, if we are decreasing the amount of requests and the amount of resources that they need to fetch in order to see the application, we are basically making the, the performance better. And what's more, because performance can be like a raw number and you can just do some kind of audits or tests and see, okay, my performance is like 97. But what's really important is the, the user experience because this is what we are aiming for, especially in terms of performance. To deliver our application and its functionalities as fast as possible to the user. How do code bundles and data transfer impact web application performance. As I mentioned, those bundles, if we have the application um, and say if it's code splitted so that the code is splitted per each root, uh, it makes the application load only the code that is needed for that certain certain website. And because we are fetching less code, we are the, the data transfer are small data transfers are smaller. We need to fetch less amount of data. We need to probably send less amount of requests, which basically improves the, the, the performance in general of our application. This is also why modern frameworks like Next.js, Next, they utilize this approach by, by default to deliver the, the best performance possible out of the box. And those kind of aspects or, or patterns like code splitting and and bundling and and separating those requests per, per root is basically something that in the past you would have to do on your own like implement your own um, approach to that and thanks to the work of many let's say geniuses who are building those frameworks we can just utilize them without even knowing about it we just use it and it works and it makes our application uh, faster by default and this is also what I think that it's crucial in terms of the modern frameworks and modern web applications is that they take this small part or sometimes not even small, sometimes it's a, it's a big part, but they take this part that you should uh, or, or had to do in the past manually and they do it for you so you can just utilize it without actually caring about it. You just use it, it works. And as I mentioned, it doesn't be some. It doesn't have to be something huge. It can be even a small feature, but because of the fact that it is done automatically for you, it delivers a really great experience for you as a developer who are who is building the application with this framework, and obviously for the end user because if the user gets better performance, the um, the uh, overall experience of using the website is better. However, at this point, I wanted to, to mention something something different as well, because those are quite technical, I would say, um, technical approaches to improving performance. However, there are also some things that you can do to 
improve something what is um, called perceived performance because performance can be measured in some kind by using some kind of device uh, some kind of tools like lighthouse page speed insights uh, speed curve a web page test stuff like that and you will get some kind of a score whether it's good bad it will have a number like 97 as i mentioned however these are all just numbers like raw numbers so this is one part of the table and the second part of the table is the perceived performance. So actually how the users are perceiving your website. And I intend this specifically because even for the slow websites, you can make them relatively fast because you will be working on this perceived performance. So how the users actually perceive the website. And what I mean by that is Let's say that your application fetch, fetches some data from the backend. Frontend fetches data from, from the backend. And you basically cannot optimize this request because it basically takes this amount of time. Let's say five seconds. So if you leave it like this, so we'll leave the user just hanging on the on the on the page and just waiting five seconds for the data to be fetched. The user will be probably not very happy about it. And in after some time, she might decide to just leave your website because the experience is too bad. However, if you manage to do something about the perceived performance, for example, showing the state of, let's say, the loading, and I not only mean, and I don't only mean the loading, like the spinner or something like that, but also about the whole progress of loading. So if you are fetching images, maybe you can just show a placeholder. This is something that you can do in CSS without actually needing to fetch the data from the backend. And because of that, you can create those stages of fetching the data, which will tell the user, OK, I need to wait. But here you see the progress. You see that there is some, some change, even though under the hood, there is no change. You still wait for the data. You still need to wait those five seconds for the data to be fetched correctly. However, because of the fact that you are just showing this, let's say, imaginary progress, the user will be more focused on staying because he will see that something is changing. That, okay, maybe it's worth to stay. Okay, we, it, it is taking a longer time, but yeah, I see the progress. So maybe it's worth to stay. So this is quite interesting part of the working with performance in general, is that there is not only like technical things that you can do. There are also a lot of like I would call it those perceived performance things you can do for your application to basically have better uh, perceived performance and user experience in general as well. Can you dive into the process and the benefits of lazy loading images? In terms of lazy lazy loading images, um, because of the fact that maybe I will start with something different first in terms of images in general, because I would say that images are the most uh, performance blocking resources on your website. Um, and I did this on the Vue.js London conference. I asked the audience to raise the question, who is using images? on their websites. So basically everyone raised their hand because everyone is using images. So once I asked, okay, so do you optimize those images in any way? And I asked this specifically because if you worked with images, you probably know the term optimizing. So more, more or less like half of the audience raised their hand. So because of that, it means that basically half of the people are actually doing something with the images to make them more performant, like optimized. So lazy loading is one of those things that you can do with the images. I mentioned the example with the um, with the gallery of images, but it can be even something else. Let's say that we have some icons in the footer of our company, of I don't know, our customers, our employees. It can be whatever. So we have those icons. If they are loaded when the user visits the 
homepage. So probably he will see the navigation hero banner or some kind of portfolio page. He doesn't need to fetch those icons that are in the footer. So lazy loading is one of these this things that you can do. Second one, which is especially important, is the um, format of the images. So usually uh, we just fetch the images as they are, just fetch them with the uh, with the link that we get from I don't know our designers. So our designer is let's say uploading the image to to some kind of I don't know digital asset management system, or basically we are storing it in our application like in static. So we get those images, we put them on our website, and we get on like. We, we won't be taking care of it. And this is a huge mistake because those images most probably are not optimized for the modern web, which means they might be too big for the for the use case. So we might be using them to, let's say, for for the for this gallery where each of the image can be like 200 per 200, like height and width, and we'll be fetching them in a full HD resolution. So they are too big, so we have to squeeze them to to basically fit the card or fit the the, um, the gallery element. And so we have the resolution, we have the format. Usually, we will have images in JPEG, for example, which is not the most performant currently in web development. And uh, the most used one is the WebP format which can be sometimes three or four times lighter than JPEG. And right now also, um, but I'm not sure what uh, what browsers support it. I think it's on the Chrome right now. However, after mm, throughout so, some months or, or years, probably other browsers will support it as well. It is the Aviv format, which is even lighter. So I did this kind of uh, a comparison comparison during the, the Vue.js London conference where I showed, okay, here you have the image, which is in a PNG format, and here you have the image, which is in Aviv format. So the difference was 10 times. The Aviv was 10 times smaller than the one in PNG. So imagine for every image, if you are using PNG or JPEG, you are basically fetching 10 times more data. And yeah, this the size of kilobytes is like 10 times bigger for each consecutive image. Um, yeah, so, so how do we implement this like lazy loading? Because I started with the lazy loading, then jumped to images in general. So so right now I wanted to, to come back to, to those lazy of the images. So we have this attribute in um, in image, image tag, which is called loading, and we can set it to lazy. And basically that's it. And it's really a game changer because it's just a one line, which will make your life easier. In the past, uh, you had to use different um, different solutions for that. So basically, stuff like Lozat. There is this package, uh, JavaScript package Lozat.js, which allowed you to um, defer loading certain resources. But it wasn't only focused on the images. It was also working with video, with audio elements. So basically, any kind of any kind of resource you were able to to lazy load uh, when needed. Mm, you of course could use the intersection observer, which is like the built-in uh, approach for for um, built-in in, in in the browsers. However, right now the most common use case or the common approach to implement lazy loading is to basically add this one attribute, which will work like a charm. However, there are some uh, bad usages of it because. I, I even mentioned it once, uh, I'm not sure where, but if you look at the documentation in Mozilla about this attribute, it will, the, the definition, the official definition is that if you set it to lazy, it will load the resource 
the image resource exactly when it is needed. And because of that, I've seen that so many people are using it in the wrong way. And what I mean by wrong way is they are using it, for example, for the elements that are supposed to be the um, from the Core Web Vitals largest con contentful paint. So for those of, for, for, of uh, listeners who, who are not familiar with Core Web Vitals, uh, those are like the metrics defined by Google um, based on a lot of different um, research, researches and um, experiments on the modern websites. And they, they have defined those kind of metrics that you can use to basically measure how your uh, website is um, behaving and basically is it performant or not. Because you have the Lighthouse, for example, test where you do it and you get like 97. But then you have those metrics that uh, each of them represents something different. So how much time does it take to load an element? How much time does it take um, for an interaction? direction to 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 occur how much your website is wiggling like how many shifts are there so coming back to this largest con contentful paint this is a metric that shows how much time does it take to load the largest element on the website on the initial load so usually this is an image of some sort like i don't know the the hero banner stuff like that in the e-commerce for example like your most, uh, like the best product, for example, Apple websites who have those iPhones, MacBooks, usually the, the largest contentful paint there is this iPhone or, or phone image. So this element has to be loaded as fast as possible. Like really, this is the most important element for, for the initial load. So you should really pay attention to make it fa make it load as fast as possible. So what you do by adding this attribute loading lazy is that you are putting the resource, the, the request to fetch this resource for the image at the end of the request loop or the request queue. So if you do that on the largest contentful paint, you will actually load it um, later, not faster. And because of the, the fact that, in as I mentioned in the Mozilla documentation, it says when needed, like it will be loaded when needed, users use it in a wrong way. Because in other documentations, like in Google Web Dev, they say specifically that you will delay the request for, for, this, um, for this resource and it will result in having this request at the, let's say, added to the request queue. And because of that, you will have the worst performance. So if you want to learn something from this podcast, I have one small thing for you, which is basically if you have a uh, largest contentful paint, don't add the attribute lazy, there, lazy loading there. Just don't do it. <laughs> you can use it everywhere else when needed, but this particular element it can't have lazy loading. How does the HTML loading attribute add in image lazy loading? Basically, I, I think I, I said, um, explains some parts of it already. Uh, it's basically that you can use the, um, the native EMG tag the way that you use it before, uh, or you can use a picture if you like. However, for the image, you can just add this certain attribute to, to the list of your attributes for, for, the, for this particular HTML element. And yeah, you have two options. One is lazy and one is, um, I think, auto or something like that. I usually use the, uh, the lazy or none. Basically, those are two options for me. So either doing it lazy when needed. So for example, for the images below default, or just don't add it for the LCP, for example. So the usage is really, really simple. While, as I mentioned, it causes the browser, like instructs the browser that for this kind of resources, you can basically load them later. And what's more here is uh, quite important is that loading is one parameter, one attribute that can help you with that. 
but you can also use the um, fetch priority, which is another attribute uh, available for, for uh, loading the, the resources. And by using it, you can just say, okay, for this kind of resource, I want it to be fetched as fast as possible. So I can say fetch priority high, and this will tell the browser, okay, this element is quite crucial for the website. So I will load it as soon as possible. And obviously in the opposite, what we can do is we can say, okay, this element is not particularly um, useful or not, not useful, but uh, necessary for the page to load and behave correctly. So we can load it later on. So browser will put the request for this kind of resource at the end of the request queue so that it doesn't block anything else. Um, and what's more about the LCP, like the largest contentful paint, the, the metric I mentioned, um, for sure, don't make it a lazy loaded. As I mentioned, this is a really bad, bad practice. Uh, you should be adding this fetch priority there, like to make, to, to instruct the browser that, okay, this is, this element is really, really useful, uh, really um, necessary. So make sure to load it as fast as possible. And what you can do, you can also preload the the um, this required resource. So how does it work? Is that you can instruct the browser by adding the HTML tag for the meta, and then you will preload this image. So you will instruct the browser to basically before actually um, fetching the whole website and fetching all the scripts, all the resources, you should be fetching this certain uh, asset first. So in this particular case, this image that will be used on, let's say, the homepage. Could you elaborate on lazy hydration and its impact on server-side rendered apps? You have different types of, uh, you have different rendering modes, basically, nowadays in web applications. Um, long time ago, when I wasn't actually developing yet, like programming, there was this approach of multi-page apps where you're basically sending different pages like from the server. And then this was the approach back then and it was more like server side approach. However, then the idea from both Facebook and React came to create those SPAs, so single page applications. And then the idea was to have one index HTML that will be sent from the server and then to let JavaScript do all the magic. So display different pages, there will be no um, like fetching for different page to, so, so that the user won't have to wait for a different page to be fetched from the, from the server. Everything will be there on the front end just for the user to, to use. So the navigation will be purely on the front end, uh, like all the authentication stuff, for example, will be on the front end. But then, um, wise guys of the web development, I would say, uh, realized that maybe putting too much JavaScript into your browser is not a good idea because then it will make your application slower and more users might have some issues with accessing your website because of the amount of JavaScript. So then they decided, okay, uh, we have to find another way to have those kind of like dynamic pages, but without JavaScript. So this is another like challenge, I would say. So then the, the era of statically generated websites came. So those SSG, so um, things like um, Huko, I think it's, it's one of the most, most popular. Uh, Gatsby in, in React was also an SSG. So then there was another idea. Why don't we use something like a hybrid? So we will tell, okay, we can use, or actually before there was also one more, which is server-side rendering, which basically works that you have dynamic pages that are rendered on the server and delivered to the, to the browser, to the user in a form of a pure HTML. So you have this, let's say, mix of uh, dynamic and static, static content in one. So this is the SSR. And then this is the, the one concept that I think right now is the most popular, which is hybrid, so that you can decide what parts of your application should be 
rendered in a certain way. So you can say, okay, for the homepage, I want it to be statically generated because it contains only static things. For, I don't know, product page in e-commerce um, area where, where I specialize in. Uh, for the product page, I want it to be rendered on the server because I might have, I don't know, 10,000 pages. So storing those static pages of each product might not be the best idea. Maybe it will be safer to just render it on the server. And for example, for the you know, the login page or, or the user authentication page, we will do it on the SDA. So like on the client side. So coming back to the initial question, which was about server side rendering. Um, in server side rendering, you have this hydration process. It basically uh, works in a way that um, server is sending the HTML and then it's, it is hydrate like static HTML, and then it is hydrating it with the new content with, with basically JavaScript. So based on that, though the modern frameworks are doing it mostly automatically without you needing to worry about it, about this process. However, you have this pattern of lazy hydration, which gives you more control of this, of this hydration process so that you can decide, for example, this part of my application, I know that it should be hydrated with, with logic, with JavaScript, but maybe thanks to this lazy hydration, I could just tell it the application to hydrate this part with JavaScript on some kind of interaction, maybe a scroll, maybe a click, maybe a zoom, something like this, and then load the JavaScript there. So because of that, we can have the pure HTML that already looks as it should and just add the interaction when needed. This is something what, what uh, modern frameworks can't do right now because they are not so intelligent to decide on every type of application when certain, um, certain parts should be hydrated. So by using concepts such as this lazy hydration, we have full control of it or control over it and we can decide when certain parts should be hydrated. Maybe some parts shouldn't be hydrated at all. Maybe there are some parts of your application that don't need JavaScript at all. And we can just say, okay, this part doesn't need hydration, doesn't need JavaScript. Apart from the lazy pattern, what other patterns would you recommend to enhance web app performance? I mentioned about the persist performance. This is something that I am recommending everyone to check out. Um, there is also this PRPL pattern, PRPL pattern, I think. Uh, this is uh, also what Filip uh, Rakowski, uh, my friend from Viewstorefront, actually one of the founders, he's talking about it a lot, which is basically um, it's quite similar to this persist performance. And um, yeah, so those two for sure. And also something that I'm not sure if it has a name already, but uh, I call it continuous auditing, which is basically to start auditing performance of your application, not when it is actually deployed to production. And then you do the test and you realize, okay, my website is slow because usually then it's a lot of time required to, to, to fix it, to make it more performant, but to start auditing the performance when you start a project. So if you are building modern web, web applications, you most probably, I hope so, are writing some unit tests or end-to-end -end tests, maybe using Cypress, maybe using tools such as Playwright, which is gaining a lot of popularity. Unit tests, for example, with B-test. So in many companies, the process for end-to-end -end testing, unit testing is more or less, uh, more or less uh, strict and defined. So we start a project, we start building new elements, new features, but we also add unit tests, we add end-to-end -end tests so that the application is um, tested basically and it's stable. So why shouldn't we put this performance auditing there as another process? And there is also one more aspect that is also not covered that much in modern web applications, 
which is basically about the accessibility. This is also something that uh, a lot of projects, products, and companies realize too late that they haven't done work on this particular area where they should start at the very beginning. So there are two, there are tools that will help you audit your website, both in um, accessibility, both in uh, performance, relatively easy. The, the implementation or integration with them is, I know, five steps. And it gives you this continuous knowledge about how your application is behaving. So you see those kind of stuff that maybe certain parts of your application are slowing down the, the website um, or maybe some parts are not accessible at all. So you have tools such as Lighthouse, as I mentioned, and um, you have PageSpeed Insights, which is also re- especially uh, useful. I, I, I forgot to mention about it, that if you have Lighthouse, Lighthouse is only auditing your website um, using so-called lab data. So lab data is just when you take your application, you put it in some kind of isolated environment without traffic, without um, other like third party things, and you just measure the performance there. So for many cases, this might not be accurate because your website might have worse performance because there are I know millions of users who are using it. So naturally your performance will be worse then. So what does the PageSpeed Insights um, API do? Is that it gathers the data from the Lighthouse and it also gathers, which is the lab data, and it also gathers the data from the users, which is uh, called the field data, from the field, actually. So you have this CRUX, I hope that I pronounce it correctly, so Chrome User Experience, which is basically a project from, from Google and specifically from Chrome Chrome browser, that they collect this anonymous data about different view- viewers or users of your application. So you can fetch this data from PageSpeed Insights to have insights in how real users are using your website. What is their performance? So you can, in many cases, uh, this can be really interesting to see because um, you might see those differences. So for example, for the real users, the scores might be completely different. And for, as I said, for the lab data, that might be different as well. So sometimes you can come into very interesting results. Like, okay, so what is going on? Like in the isolated environment, this app behaves very well. Like for, I mentioned this uh, layout shifts. So how much your website is wiggling. And for example, there it is stable. But for the real users, it is not that stable. So what is going on? Something is wrong there for the users. And you have to think, okay, so mo- what might be the issue? Yeah, so I mentioned the, the page speed insights, which is very good. And I'm using it on a daily basis to, to analyze the, the, the websites. And for the accessibility, of course, you can use um, Lighthouse. It also comes with some accessibility stuff, but you have also tools uh, such as um, Axe. It is a tool that scans your HTML and tells you what kind of um, issues of uh, WCAG, like this this document for web accessibility, uh, your application is failing. So you're running the test of Axe and you instantly see, okay, I have to add ARIA label here. I have to add uh, controls with keyboards here and stuff like that. So by adding those two tools, so accessibility auditing and performance auditing to your continuous integration, you are less, um, let's say, your application will be more stable, will be more performant, will have a better quality. And if you implement it from the very beginning, you won't have issues such as many like users and customers had that they went to production then some of the customers, for example, or users did some um, performance testing or auditing, and they said, hey, this performance is so poor. You have to do something about it. And then there is like 
three or four months of refactoring, of trying to find ways how we can improve the application to just not lose the clients. Could you dive into the role of caching in web performance? Sure. So in terms of caching, how it works is basically that you have this caching layer that can uh, cache some of the resources. It can be certain assets. It can be images, can be JavaScript files, can be HTML files, can be even whole pages. So how, for example, we are using it at Vue Storefront for, for our customers is that we are using Redis as this caching layer between the e-commerce platform and our application, the, the storefront. So to it won't improve the performance, like the first time performance. So maybe I will jump a little bit back and explain how it works. So caching works like this. You are sending a request to a database. You are fetching some data. If you are using this caching layer, what will happen is that if configured correctly, this caching layer will intercept the response from the database. So the certain uh, data that needed to be fetched, it will store it somewhere, maybe in memory, maybe in another database that is much faster to, to, to read. So then if you will try to fetch the same data from this database, you will get the served cached like content from this not another source, so memory or, or Redis or whatever. And because of that, you won't have to request the same amount of data again and again and again from the database, which might be time consuming. And instead, you just deliver the previous result to the user. So this can come very handy uh, when working, for example, with e-commerce websites, because you might have the product pages. So you have the image, you have the price, product title, you have related products. Uh, you have some description, stuff like that. You can store all this data into the caching layer, like Redis, for example, so that when another client, client, the next one, will try to see the same product page, he will get the um, he will get the result that was cached and stored in Redis instead, which can increase the performance by a mile. Because normally it will take, I don't know, 300 or 400 seconds, for example, for the resource to be fetched. And by using caching, you can go to two, three, four milliseconds results such as this one. But as I mentioned, it won't work for the first time because it has to be cached. So you have to fetch this, this data at least once. So you fetch it, it is stored, and then the next fetch will be using this caching layer, which will basically allow you to fetch it much, much faster. Could you give a practical example how caching works, specifically regarding front-end to back-end requests? I would say that the, the example that I sh shared with the product page is quite useful, but it, can, it doesn't have to be e-commerce related. It can be anything else. It can be blog posts. Uh, it can be uh, some kind of portfolio pages where you are storing your projects and you want to share them as fast as possible. So you fetch them from the database, then you store them in some kind of fast um, reading database like Redis, like Elasticsearch, which basically searches through the keys, key, per, key uh, value pairs. And based on that, you can just fetch, fetch it much, much faster than if you would like fetch it every time from, from the database. So what are the potential risk or drawbacks of caching? Sure. Um, the drawbacks can be sometimes quite painful, and we have learned it, about it in Vue Storefront a few, few times <laughs> for our customers, is that you can't cache everything because it seems like, oh, this is a great idea. I will cache everything from now on. But it's similar to what I mentioned about the lazy loading images. It should be used in particular examples, in particular use cases, not everywhere. So I mentioned this example of product page. So this is a page that 
contains some data, but this is not some kind of um, uh, how it's called um, security data or basically the data that is related to some kind of user. This is basically a product with some price details and descriptions related products. This can be cached easily. However, you should make sure to not cache things that contain some uh, confidential data. Like, for sure, do not cache pages that are related to login, to register, to my account. Because what will happen is that if you will cache this so-called my account page, it will be sent to all the users, all the next users. They will be getting the same page. And because of that, you might have issues that user A will get the my account page of user B, which is really bad. Like this is one of the, the worst things that you can do in terms of security. This is the called um, um, broken access controls where it can be, can be used here, like the, this uh, security attack. Uh, but yeah, this is totally wrong. Don't do it. Just, I would recommend to use the caching on the pages that are mostly viewed in the same way. So the home page, for example, uh, product page or project page, maybe if it's not e-commerce related, or collections. If you have a large collections of items, maybe you would have you would like to fetch to, to store them in cache so that the the user will get them faster. Obviously, later on, you would have to invalidate this cache because maybe users will, would like to fetch different uh, different data or different um, or the data that is uh, filtered or sorted in a different way. So then you cannot serve the same from the cache. So, so in general, I would say that there are many um, useful cases for caching. And like, as I mentioned, the, the, the product page, the project page, collections, so large amount of items that you can uh, store in cache so that the second and next consecutive users will get it faster. But just keep in mind this this uh, thing that it's to keep the cache away from user-related stuff. So if it's not related to any user, you can put it in cache. If it's related, unfortunately, you have to do the request every time. Okay, so when should I measure the performance of the website? From the very beginning, <laughs> and this is my solid recommendation. If you start a project and just add performance auditing to it. For Lighthouse, for example, they are even the GitHub actions, if you are using GitHub, uh, that you can integrate in three or four steps, I think, uh, which gives you those nice um, comments on your pull request with the results that you can uh, the, with the results of performance for pages that you can easily configure by using the Lighthouse config. You can say that you want to measure page A, page B, and page C, and you also can set a budget. So how does budget work is you can define certain values for those metrics, and if the current values will be higher than that or lower, based on the the um the the amount the, the values basically the action this github action for for lighthouse will fail for example so let's say that i want to keep my largest content full paint in a in this very good um measure which is let's say less than two and a half seconds i can set it in the budget so that once the largest content full paint will be will be above two and a half seconds, let's say five, this GitHub action will fail. And if I have it configured in my GitHub repository, and um, those are like protective rules, I won't be able to merge this pull request because this GitHub action was failed. Failed and I have to fix it so that this action will be success and then I could proceed with the next feature. So by using those simple tools, we are making sure that throughout the development, our application will be performant and um, yeah, our users will have better experience using it. However, as I mentioned before, it's not enough to just collect this like lab data. You can also combine it with PageSpeed Insights. 
You can also use it in some sort of GitHub action, but I'm not sure if they have uh, such uh, well, let's say, described uh, example of GitHub action for PageSpeed Insights as they have for Lighthouse. But PageSpeed Insights has their own API publicly open, so you can just send a request with curl and just get the response with the with the uh, result of of auditing the performance for the real users as well. So just to summarize, to summarize it, as soon as possible. You start a project, you add performance auditing to it. Uh, even more welcome will be accessibility auditing, stuff like that, but maybe not. let's not demand everything from the beginning. Performance auditing will be enough. What is continuous performance auditing and how can it help me keep the desired performance? Continuous performance auditing uh, can be delivered in a way that I mentioned for by using this CI CD tools such as GitHub Action, but you can also utilize other tools, other performance auditing tools. There are actually like 20 or 30 tools on the market that you can use uh, for performance auditing. Um, each of them is used for something different. I would say they have different use cases. Some of them uh, focus much more on this uh, auditing part, but the the day-by-day -day results of actually deployed applications, some of them focus more on the code, so the source code of the application. So I would recommend you to just basically search for web performance tools, and you will see the, the list of available, available applications, which one of them I'm using on the daily basis is for sure the Lighthouse and for sure the PageSpeed Insights. Those two, PageSpeed Insights also uses Lighthouse, but I mentioned Lighthouse because I'm using it also on my local de device, not from the website. Just to get more, more, um, more accurate results. So this continuous performance auditing, the main idea behind it is to as you have with continuous integration like LinkedIn, Prettier stuff, you have it from the very beginning in your project, add this performance auditing as well so that each new pull request, each new feature, your website is audited automatically by, by either Lighthouse or PageSpeed Insights and you get the results and you know exactly whether you have to fix something or you are going to completely write the election and you can just proceed with next features. What packages would you recommend for improving performance of websites? So the best tools and the best packages that I can recommend are those uh, which you can just add and they work for you. So no configuration needed. They are just added and they just work and make your application better. So um, there are tools such as Fontaine. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, this is a tool created by, um, by Daniel Rowe who is a man behind Next.js framework right now. It's like the, the core contributor, the core maintainer of it. And he realized that in Vit applications, so in React, Svelte, Vue, what is happening is that sometimes you get this issue of um, bad CLS score. CLS is cumulative layout shift, which is basically the stability part of your application. Uh, and you get those results, they are quite bad because of the fonts. So you fetch the dynamic fonts and the browser serves certain type of font, like for example, the default system font. And then it is replaced by this custom font that we are fetching. And because of that, you can get this layout shift because of the font change and different sizes, different margins and stuff like that. And because of that, you get this layout shift. So what this Fontaine does is that it makes sure that even if you are fetching this custom font, it tries to make this uh, transition between the fonts as smooth as possible so that this, this CLS score won't drop and it won't result in an uh, application basically jumping in front of your eyes. So for sure, tools such as this one, there is also a really great tool created by the team from Builder.io, uh, which is called Party Town, which is also quite popular right now. And how it works is that you can utilize it to 
and move certain third-party services, third-party scripts such as Google Analytics or um, plausible, so analytics scripts, into a web worker so that they won't slow down the, um, the initial load of the application, which can be really useful because as you probably know, uh, Google Analytics is not the lightest script and there are many applications that are suffering from it. And if you look at the examples of how you should add Google Analytics to the website, usually they will say to you, okay, put it in the like HTML head of your application, which will basically mean, okay, uh, fetch it everywhere, everywhere possible, and it will make your application slower. So by using this party town, we can move it to a web worker, which will make uh, help our application uh, be a bit faster. Um, I mentioned lazy hydration. There are packages for that. I mentioned lazy loading, but not only loading, lazy loading images, but also lazy loading in general, because you might have uh, use cases where you want to lazy load whole elements of your page just because they are not needed and you can lazy load everything. Uh, once, for example, the user needs it. So you have packages like Lozat. Yeah, I think th those ones are, are quite useful. How about uh, Google Maps? Do you have some recommendation? So this is something what we are currently working in the um, in the Next team because I'm not part, I'm not like official part of the Next team. I am an insider, which is a person who is working with the core team to create new functionalities, new features. So we are currently working with the Chrome team as well to work on a new package that will be used in Next, which will be specifically targeting the scripts. So the, the case you mentioned about Google Maps. So I don't have a clear answer right now for you, uh, but I'm sure uh, for our next meeting, probably quite uh, soon, I will have some more info about it because I will be diving deeper into, into this topic, how we can optimize um, fetching the, the things such as, for example, Google Maps. Can I use some tools that would help me deliver optimized images for better performance? Usually you can optimize them manually. So for example, you have those on, on you have those websites that allow you to convert JPEG to WebP and stuff like that, but this is really manual process. So what you can do instead is you can use the, I call it image optimizing services. And you have tools, for example, like IPX. You can search it in GitHub. This is one of the side projects that is created, was created by the Next team, which is a local image optimizer. It is based on Sharp and Lib something. I don't remember the name of the second package, but it is based on those two. And how it works is it takes the image and based on the parameters that you send as well, like the options, it can output to you another image, which will basically have those um, those specifications that you select. So it can convert the image uh, format, it can convert the size, it can crop the image, it can add some gravity stuff. So based on that, you can locally be able to optimize those images on the fly. But in some cases, you might not be able to use such a local um, local tool because you have to self-host it. It is a package. Um, or you have to have it somewhere on your, for example, server side of your application to be able to um, optimize those images. So you can use the tools such as Cloudinary, which is digital asset management. And how it works is it works fairly similar, but it's a third party service. So it's managed by the, the company, the, the Cloudinary. So we can just send a request to them saying, okay, I want this image, but I want it in a different format, in a different size. Uh, I want it to have some kind of text overlay and stuff like that. There are actually many, many uh, optimization transformations options available, like effects, uh, like removing background, stuff like that. And everything can be done on the fly. You just need to add those options and you get them in return, this, this image that you want. And they are really fast. Like <laughs> this, the, this fetching those images is really, really fast. And um, yeah, I have an interesting news about that uh, because uh, actually tomorrow, which is like 13th of July, 
Uh, there will be a huge announcement from Cloudiary about the community project that I was also um, contributing to. So stay tuned because there will be some cool, cool new features and cool new um, packages available for for majority of the frameworks. I would say. What is per seed performance and how can I use it to deliver better user experience? Per seed performance is how users are perceiving performance. It's it sounds bad, but it is what it is. So if you have this fetching data functionality, like you're fetching, for example, user account, and it's taking a lot of time. So you can decrease the amount of, um, let's say, I w don't want to say rage, but the, the, the bad emotions related to waiting, because we all don't like to wait, like waiting in a queue for to getting some, some uh, groceries, it's like the worst thing ever, and especially for, for me. So what can be done here to make this pain smaller is to show this user a path that he is going somewhere and obviously he has to wait because we cannot make it faster but we can show him the progress so that he feels not he naturally feels that he is going through some obstacles but he is going to the right direction it's not that something broke and he doesn't know what to do uh, so this is a quick tip uh, always show a loader like if you don't have a budget or, or time to develop any of this like perceived performance improvements just add a loader once the data is fetched because if there will be nothing user will basically don't know whether he did something good or wrong because he clicked the button to fetch something and there is no change so this can be also implemented in some kind of uh, in elements that usually are very bad in terms of performance, which are, for example, um, sliders. Because sliders usually use some sort of JavaScript, so they are they can be delivered instantly because they need the JavaScript. They are not pure HTML. So I heard this um, interesting approach to to serving such such, such a slider is that first what you do is you show the uh, like blurred placeholder in the place where the slider should be. Then you replace it with the static image of the slider, just image. And then once JavaScript is loaded, you show the actual slider. So you have those three steps where you show the user something that he can relate to instead of just showing, okay, empty, empty div. Where, where there should be a slider, but it's not there yet because you, are, you need to wait for the JavaScript. So I would say that the perceived performance is this journey that we are taking the user to make his, his or her experience of using the website much smoother, especially if we can't fix it any other way. What advice would you give to people who are just starting their career in the software world today and what for those who are old timers? Considering the the evolution of tools such as AI, such as Mid Journey, stuff like that, it seems that we are going in the direction where um, the web development, as we know today, purely this um, let's say por yeah, I would call it portfolio development, where you just a company is um, coming to you to just create a portfolio page for them. Those kind of jobs might be like obsolete in a few years, thanks to this AI, because it will be able to do those kind of things easily. So I would say that obviously learning um, new technologies is crucial to be up to date with it. But I still think that at certain point you would need those, um, I would call them soft and behavioral skills. This is something that differentiates one developer from another because if you have those skills those soft skills like skills to adapt to new new situations new conditions you will learn because if you have learned one language it will be much easier for you to learn another one and uh, of course it won't be like the switch in one day because there are different concepts different packages different patterns stuff like that but some things are common 
for for different languages. So if you know one, it won't be as difficult for you to jump to another. However, if you have this ability to adapt, so constantly learning, constantly uh, evolving, let's say, and focusing on what can be the next like interesting topic on the web will give you this ability of being at the top and just, for example, getting a new job or getting a promotion. And for for those uh, who are old timers, um, I would say that, yeah, there is a lot of things that we need to learn. <laughs> Even though we are old timers uh, and we are doing in this, in this uh, area for, for some time already, we still have to learn. And there are so many new things new topics. Some of them obviously are just renamed. So the topics, for, I think the, there was one presentation about big data. That the concept about big data was actually invented like 50 years ago. And then there were all the tools that we, we tried to utilize to, to make it work with those huge amounts of data. And then it comes today and it's still a hot topic. And I'm pretty sure that it was a case with AI as well. It was popular I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, then it stopped for some time. And today is still a hugely anticipated and, and required topic. So I would say for the old timers that we need to be up to date with the new trends because otherwise, basically, if you are not learning, like if you think that with your current knowledge, you will be enough, you are going backwards. You have to be learning constantly to be in the middle, let's say. So, yeah. But this is also what is really funny. Not funny, but fun in this in this uh, aspect of programming. Is that every day you're learning something new. Either it is a new CSS attribute or CSS property or HTML attribute, or either it's a completely new concept. Every day you are learning. And this is the best what can be in the IT world, I would say. My last question, two books you would recommend to our listeners. Okay, so I might not be the best candidate for speaking about books because um, I read about, I don't know, 20 or 30 in my life. So it's not, not a lot, I would say. Uh, but for the technical ones, um, I have an issue with, with uh, books such as, for example, for Vue.js or React because... There are so many things that are constantly changing there that uh, as a creator of this book, you start writing it. And once you publish it, it most probably is already out of date because there are so many new things. So I'm not a fan of those, but I am a huge fan of the books or eBooks about concepts. So I have actually one book here, which is called um, Security of Web Applications. It is in Polish. It was created by the, the Polish company and that is spe specializing in the IT security. So even though it was released a few years ago, those concepts are still alive. I can still learn from them and adjust my current application to, to be, let's say, secured against, against uh, attacks and, and, and issues that are described there, even though, as I mentioned, it was published no, four years ago and probably created five or six years ago. So even though this the, the this uh, period of time, it is still up to date, which is not the case probably with those books that are teaching you how to build a component in, in Vue.js, for example. So I would say the books about patterns, so such as this one, maybe patterns such as architecture patterns, this is something that um, will not go away. This is exactly the case with SQL, for example. SQL was invented so long ago, and it's still used until today in a very similar form. So actually what I learned during my studies, um, I learned about Python, I learned about um, PHP, stuff like that, those web development technologies, uh, I, about Java, about C Sharp. And those C Sharp, Java, Python, and PHP, all the, the topics that I learned are already out of date. I cannot use them, what I learned during, during studies, because it was a few years ago. SQL, 
the same the same syntax I can use until today. This is something that won't die, basically. I don't know how they do it, but it just won't die. So it might be strange to, to recommend reading an SQL book, but if I could come back to my studies and just focus more on the, the SQL lectures that I had, I would be much more a much, much happier man today because nowadays I have to learn those uh, on the go. And for the non-technical one, uh, I would recommend a book. Uh, it is called um, Deep Work by Cal Newport, which basically shows you ways how you can uh, focus your mind to work more efficiently. But it's not only about work, it's also about the how you spend time, basically. Because this is what is especially difficult in modern days, is that we have so many things that want to, tr to, to get our attention, like uh, messaging, like Slack, like emails, stuff like that. They, they aren't all want our attention, that we have to make sure to not like get eaten by them, because we should be controlling them, not the other way around. So this book is really nice. It's really short. It's about, I don't know, 200 pages. So for someone who is pro proficient with reading, not as I am, uh, it will be an evening or two probably. So uh, yeah, it's really short, but it really opened my mind in terms of uh, my mind and my eyes in terms of what I can do to basically focus more on what I do every day. Kuba, thank you. Thank you so much for this great episode a lot of information, a lot of great tools. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>